Mary Boyle. On St. Patrick's Day, 1977, seven-year-old Mary Boyle was visiting her grandparents in County Donegal, Ireland. At one point, she followed her uncle, who was going to visit his neighbors less than half a kilometer away. As they were walking through a field, they came to a particularly marshy part, and he sent her back to her grandparents' house. She was never seen again. How she disappeared in such a short span of time, less than five minutes, has been puzzling for detectives who continue to work on the case to this day. But the investigation was handled extremely poorly from the beginning. Despite a report that hair and clothes were visible in a nearby shallow grave in the days following Mary's disappearance, that site was not examined until 2013. When it was investigated, police excavated it. Not with care and forensic tools, but with the JCB excavator. No evidence was found, very possibly because it was destroyed as a result of being carelessly uprooted after 36 years, instead of following procedure. Mary's identical twin sister, Anne, has also been active in trying to discover Mary's fate. Unlike the twin's mother, who holds out hope that her daughter is alive, Anne believes Mary was killed and that her body was destroyed in the dig. One theory put forth is that Robert Black, a famous British child killer, is the culprit. Black spent a lot of time in Donegal in the 70s and is believed to have tried to kidnap other children in the area. While he very could well be the killer, nobody has been able to pin Mary's disappearance on him yet. 2. Ronade Murray Ronade Murray was born on 1 January 1982 to parents Jim and Deirdre Murray and lived in Glenageary, South Dublin. After finishing her shift in the boutique where she worked around 9pm, Ronade spent the evening of 3 September 1999 socialising in Scott's Pub on George Street, Dunleary, a place she frequented often, and the last location she would be seen, alive. Ronade left the pub at approximately 11.20 p.m. that evening, planning to meet up with friends later on. She never arrived. As Ronade started her 15-minute walk back to her home, it is believed she got into an argument with a man whom she may have known, described by witnesses as being in his mid-twenties. Around 25 minutes after Ronade left the pub, Witnesses said they heard a female voice expressing a cry of leave me alone and go away in the lane away between Silchester Road and Renee's home in Silchester Park. The utterance F off was also heard, followed by a loud scream. While in Silchester Crescent that fateful night, Renee was stabbed approximately four times in the side, chest, and shoulder with a one and a half inch sharp knife. The killer escaped, leaving Ronade to stagger 200 feet before ultimately collapsing and dying from her stab wounds. At 12.20 a.m. that night, her older sister found her body a mere 50 yards from the family home. Ronade was not sexually assaulted, nor were her possessions stolen. An investigation was launched immediately, but currently no motive has ever been found. However, there have been a number of suspects since the murder took place. The earliest suspect was a man in his mid-twenties, wearing light-colored combat trousers and a beige top. He was seen arguing with her less than half an hour before she was killed. The man was never identified. A taxi driver reported picking up a young man with blood on his trousers in the early hours of that Saturday morning and taking him to Granville Road at the top of Newtown Park Avenue, Black Rock. He dropped the man at a residence but did not witness him entering the home. House-to-house -house inquiries carried out at the time did not find anyone fitting the description living on that road. Later in the investigation, a suspect, who was found to have been living at the time on the other side of Newtown Park Avenue, was arrested and questioned. However, there was no evidence, and he was subsequently released. 
Then there was a Kenyan immigrant named Far Aswa'ale Noor, who was killed and dismembered in March 2005 by Linda and Charlotte Molehall, two sisters from Dublin. He allegedly threatened their mother, Kathleen Molehall, saying, I'm going to f***ing kill you, just like I did with Ronaid Murray, although he was allegedly drunk at the time. Nor, who was questioned during the initial investigation, has since been ruled out. Garda believe he falsely claimed responsibility to upset Molehall. It has been 17 years, and still no answers as to who took Ronade's life. 3. Philip Cairns On Friday, October 23rd, Philip Cairns vanished on his walk back to school. Philip was one of six children. He had four sisters, Mary, Sandra, Helen, and Susan, and one younger brother, Owen. His grandmother, May Cairns, was living with the family at the time of his disappearance. When Philip came home for lunch at about 1 p.m. that day, his grandmother and two of his sisters were also in the house. He looked in on his grandmother after doing some homework. She was the last person to see or hear Philip alive when he called out, Cheerio, Gran, I'm off, when returning to school. His mother, Alice, came home from town. There was no sign of Philip. She rang the school to say that he hadn't returned. What started out as concern quickly turned to panic. The headquarters of the Garda, which is the police force in Ireland, was stationed in Rathfarnham, and extensive searches were made of the local area. There was an individual house search within a mile radius of the scene. Every attic and hiding hole was searched by teams of detectives and uniform Garda. Hundreds of volunteers combed the local golf clubs, and the army and sub-aqua teams searched every bog hole and riverbank in the area. It was a massive undertaking. A week into the inquiry of Philip's disappearance, an event occurred that tipped the investigation and remains an intriguing mystery to this day. Philip's school bag was discovered in a laneaway off Anne Devlin Road, a few hundred meters from where he had disappeared. The bag was in plain sight when discovered. Also, although the strap was a bit wet, the main body of the bag was dry, with its contents intact despite there having been rain during the six days since his disappearance. Strangely, when the bag was discovered, some of Philip's books were missing, a geography book and two religious textbooks. Did the culprit bring it back and leave it at the scene as a red herring, or was it something to taunt the investigators? Philip's body was never found. Every sex offender and pedophile in the area was interviewed in relation to an account of his movements between 1 p.m. and 1.30 p.m. on the day Philip went missing. Despite an intensive investigation, there was no sign of Philip. Suspects were eliminated. There have been up to 400 sightings of Philip. Each has been investigated, some across the water in Britain and Europe, and many searches have been carried out in the intervening 23 years. In June 2016, a woman came forward to the Garda with new information. The woman told detectives that on the day Philip disappeared, she was in the car with Cook, the DJ and owner of a pirate radio station, Radio Dublin. The woman told the Garda that Cook knew Philip and had promised to take him to visit the radio station. She said, however, that when they got to the studios in Inchahor, a row broke out while she was in another room, and that Cook struck the child with an implement. She said she went into the room and saw the 13-year-old boy bleeding and unconscious on the floor. She told Garda that she then fainted, and when she woke up, she was in a car, being driven by Cook. She kept this information to herself for decades. Cook was a convicted pedophile who was serving a 10-year sentence for repeatedly sexually abusing two girls from January 1974 to May 1978. The offenses were committed years before Philip disappeared. 
By the time the Garda could act on the new information they received, Cook was dying. They went to see him in Arbor Hill Prison, but discovered he had been transferred to a Dublin hospice. They spoke to Cook on a number of occasions, but because of his condition and the fact that he was receiving palliative care, he could not be questioned or interrogated fully. Cook gave yes and no answers, and, to a limited extent, confirmed aspects of the statement made to the Garda by the woman who came forward, but did not tell investigators where Philip's remains were buried. Garda are not looking at any other lines of inquiry at the moment. However, without knowing where Philip's remains are, the case remains open. 4. Connor and Sheila Dwyer Connor and Sheila Dwyer went missing from Fermoy County, Cork, Ireland in 1991. Fermoy is a small town with a current population of about 5,800 people. The Dwares had lived and worked in the town, with Connor working as a part-time taxi driver and handyman while Sheila looked after the home. After years of making ends meet, they were looking forward to starting a retired life. The couple was last seen at Mass on April 30th, 1991 at St. Patrick's Church in Fermoy. After not hearing from them for weeks, Sheila's sister decided to visit the couple's home on May 18th. When nobody answered, she decided to notify the police. The police arrived and broke down the door, but could not find any sign of the Dwyer's inside. The Dwyer's Toyota Crescenda was missing but their home was otherwise completely normal. There were no signs of a struggle, a robbery, or of forced entry. The house was secure, and all of the Dwyer's personal items were still present, including their clothes and eyeglasses. The couple's passports and over 1,000 euros in cash were stashed in a tin. Curiously enough, Investigators found out that Connor Dwyer had previously gone missing for a couple of years at some point in the 1980s. He eventually returned, but never provided any explanation as to where he had been. Unfortunately, history would not repeat itself, and Connor did not return this time around. Authorities have not found any evidence to suggest what might have happened to the couple. And 20 years later, this remains one of Ireland's strangest unsolved mysteries. 5. The Irish Crown Jewels The Order of St. Patrick was created in 1783 by George III as a corresponding association to the English Order of the Garter. The King was the head and sovereign of the Order, and the Lord Lieutenant of Ireland was the Grand Master in the absence of the Sovereign. At ceremonies, the Sovereign, or the Grand Master, wore a jeweled insignia. In 1831, William VI replaced the insignia with a far more elaborate one. 394 stones were taken from English crown jewels and the Order of the Garter Star. The honors of St. Patrick consisted of two principal pieces, the star and the badge, and was valued at $250,000. When not in use, the jewels were to be kept in a steel safe in Dublin Castle along with the collars of the knights. The safe was guarded by Arthur Vickers, the jewels custodian. Vickers was known to get drunk while on overnight duty and on one instance awoke with the jewels around his neck. The safe required two keys for entry and was located in the library, which required seven keys for entry. Vickers and most of his staff held the keys to the library, but only Vickers held both keys to the safe. The last date the jewels were seen in the safe was June 11th. Several days prior to the discovery, Vickers was informed on two occasions that the doors to the library were ajar to which she responded nonchalantly. On the day of the theft, Vickers asked one of his staff to deposit the collar of a deceased knight in the safe, giving him the keys to do so. This was out of the ordinary, for only Vickers was to ever hold the keys. 
The staff member found the safe unlocked and immediately informed Vickers, who subsequently found the safe empty. The police were called and concluded the safe was not tampered with, but rather opened with keys. Vickers took the fall. He was not arrested, but lost his position. All files were destroyed. Vickers went to his grave, protesting his innocence. He was killed by the IRA in 1921. Theories abound as to what happened to the jewels. Some say Shackleton stole them and sold them to finance his explorer brother Ernest's polar expedition. Others say Vickers smuggled it to his mistress. Even others postulate that members of the IRA stole the jewels and took them to the United States, but there is no evidence to connect any of them to the stolen crown jewels, and they still remain missing to this day. 6. Maul McCarthy On 22nd November 1940, Maul McCarthy was found murdered in a field at Mar Hill near New Inn in County Tipperary. Her mutilated body was found by a neighbor, Harry Gleason, and her injuries were extensive. Her skull was fractured in several places, her jugular vein had been punctured, and her spine had been fractured. One whole side of her face was missing, from the chin right up to her eyebrow. Pieces of bone and two teeth were found nearly a foot away from the body. Some reports say she was shot in the face at close range, or that she was shot twice. Maul McCarthy, born Mary McCarthy, was the unmarried mother of seven children, which caused the parish priest to decry her from the altar, describing her as the devil's disciple. Mary was not ashamed of her lifestyle, and supposedly boasted about the men she'd entertained, and also kept a list of the men who visited her. This cemented her position as a social outcast, and the local men were worried she would name names, while the local woman feared her. The man who discovered her body, Harry Gleason, was rumored to have been the father of one of Maul's children. However, he always denied this. At the time of her murder, Harry was living nearby on his uncle's farm. Garda quickly focused their attention on Harry, and he was ultimately found guilty of her murder. On the 23rd of April, 1941, he was hanged for the murder in Mountjoy Prison. Right up until his execution, he maintained his innocence. It was tried as an open and shut case. However, some people have always seen Gleason as the victim of a cover-up. In 2015, almost 75 years after his execution, Harry Gleason received a posthumous pardon from the President of Ireland. The Department of Justice found several problems with the case as presented by the police. They found that the Garda encouraged witnesses to submit falsified statements and even beat a witness during questioning. The firearms register, a document which recorded when the ammunition was brought in, disproved a receipt for ammunition supposedly brought in by Harry Gleason's uncle, which was shown during Harry Gleason's trial. They also found, with the help of a forensic pathologist named Dr. Peter Cummings, that Mary's time of death was incorrect and that Harry Gleason had had an alibi for the actual time of death. More importantly, Maul's own daughter, Mary, later confessed on her deathbed that she saw her mother's murder that night and that an innocent man was killed for it. If Henry Gleason didn't kill Maul McCarthy, who did? Most theories point to one of the other fathers of McCarthy's children. It is even speculated that the guilty father was a captain with the Garda, which is why Gleason was framed for the murder in the first place. Another theory pinned the killing on local members of the IRA, who supposedly killed McCarthy on suspicion that she was an informant. With everyone involved in the investigation now deceased, it is unlikely this case will ever be solved. 7. The Gold of the SS Laurentic There are plenty of lost treasures in the world, but this is one you can actually get to. Well, sort of. 
The wreck of the World War I era liner, the SS Laurentic, is located just off the coast of County Donegal and is known to be one of the most accessible of Ireland's many coastal shipwrecks. According to the story, there are a bunch of gold bars still missing. The SS Laurentic was an ocean liner built at the Harland and Wolf shipyard in Belfast, Northern Ireland between 1907 and 1908. You may remember this shipyard also built the RMS Titanic only a few years later. So the same shipyard and many of the same people involved in building the Laurentic would also help to build the Titanic. When it was launched in 1909, it was state of the art and in 1914, it became the HMS Laurentic, designated for transporting troops during the war. Originally, it was outfitted with light weaponry and destined for use in patrols and escort duties across the North Atlantic. But in December 1916, its captain got new orders to deliver some important cargo to Nova Scotia. Apart from her crew and passengers, she was loaded with 3,211 ingots of gold, weighing as much as 40 tons. The value of the gold was estimated at 5 million euros at the time, but at hundreds of millions, if not billions, in today's prices. The Laurentic was temporarily delayed in its trip as it needed to make a stop to drop off some crew members that had come down with the early warning signs of yellow fever. Meanwhile, a U-boat was seen off the coast, and when the Laurentic left, it struck two mines that had been set. Although some of the crew did make it to lifeboats, the cold Atlantic storms proved deadly and many were found still sitting in the lifeboats, frozen, oars clasped in their hands. All resources during the war were valuable. Their value was so high that the British Navy couldn't leave these underwater treasures to stay and made every effort to retrieve them. By 1924, over 5,000 dives were conducted, and all but 25 of the gold ingots were recovered. In 1932, another 5 ingots were salvaged. This means that another 20 ingots still lie at the bottom of the sea. Many have wanted to dive to see the wreck and possibly search for the remaining lost gold, but few have had the privilege, as the wreck is privately owned. Today, there are better chances, as two companies, Deep Image and Green Goal Diving, have obtained diving rights and can facilitate diving expeditions. 8. The Vanishing Triangle Annie McCarrick had her entire life ahead of her when she immigrated from New York to Dublin in 1993. She was studying her Irish heritage and learning to become a teacher. In Dublin, she made friends, became fully immersed in the culture, and was taking advantage of her time there. Then, one day, she simply vanished. In the years that followed, seven more women would mysteriously disappear in close proximity to one another. That area became known as the Vanishing Triangle, a place where women went and would never return. The Vanishing Triangle is an 80 mile radius around Dublin, Ireland, where multiple young women have gone missing. Annie was last seen, according to some, in a small pub called Johnny Fox's, just outside Inniscarry, County Dublin. Annie had no boyfriend at the time, according to those who knew her, but those who had seen her at Johnny Fox's swore she had been in the company of a man that evening. It would be the last evening anyone saw Annie alive. The American students' sudden vanishing led to one of the largest searches in Ireland's history. There were no clues, no legitimate suspects, and absolutely no trace of McCarrick. She was gone, and her disappearance was just the beginning. The same year Annie McCarrick vanished, 40-year-old Eva Brennan went missing as well, after leaving her parents' home one night. The following January, Imelda Keenan, the youngest of the victims to date, disappeared near Lamard Street in Waterford. 
Keenan was followed by Josephine Dollard, a 21-year-old who went missing after hitchhiking from Dublin to her home in Kilkenny. She was last seen using a payphone along what would be her final and incomplete journey. Continuing the trend toward younger women, two 18-year-olds, Kira Breen and Deirdre Jacob, both went missing in 1998. The case of Miss Jacob, a student teacher at the time of her disappearance, remains one of the most puzzling of all the cases in the Vanishing Triangle, as there have been numerous witnesses who claimed to have seen her just yards from her parents' home on the evening she vanished. Motorists saw the girl approaching her parents' driveway, and security cameras managed to document her travels as she followed a familiar path she had known her entire life. Neighbors saw her about 200 yards from her home, and then, suddenly, she was gone. She literally was standing at the side of the road about to cross over into her home, and then she was gone. Jacob vanished in broad daylight. The final two women, both named Fiona, would disappear in 1996 and 1998. Miss Fiona Pender, 25, had been seven months pregnant when she vanished. Fiona Sinnott, age 19, had last been seen at a pub, much like Annie McCarrick just five years earlier. As the number of missing women began to accumulate, the public started to panic. In just six years, eight women were gone, without a trace. The women all shared similar physical characteristics, were between the ages of 17 and 40, and each disappeared within miles of the other. Were their disappearances connected? Some started to speculate that a serial killer was responsible. Among the suspects is convicted rapist Larry Murphy. In 2000, Murphy abducted a woman he was stalking, threw her in his trunk, and brought her to the mountains. While they were there, he raped her multiple times and then attempted to suffocate her to death. Luckily, two individuals came upon the scene and chased Murphy away. He was subsequently arrested and sentenced to 15 years in prison. He served just 10. While Murphy was in jail, the disappearances ceased. Looking into the criminal's history, it was discovered he lived and worked close to where Dollard and Jacob vanished, and he allegedly matched the descriptions of the man last seen with McCarrick the night she vanished. Despite being a suspect in the disappearances, police have never been able to charge Murphy with the crimes. There has never been enough evidence to arrest him, and no crime scenes from which to gather evidence. To date, Garda have had no luck in connecting the cases together through suspects or witnesses. 9. Peter Bergman In June of 2009, a man boarded a bus in Derry, Ireland and requested that he travel to Silgo. Once there, he checked into a hotel using a presumably false name. Peter Bergman, and gave his address as Ain Stetterson, 15, 4472 Wayne, Austria. Four days later, his body was found on a beach in Ross's Point, Silgo. While we know absolutely nothing about a man who had only but four members of the Garda in attendance at his funeral, we know much about the days leading up to his death. When authorities made an effort to investigate, they discovered that Peter Bergman didn't exist. The address he used whilst checking into the hotel also turned out to be fake, being nothing but a vacant parking lot. What authorities know is that each day he left his hotel with a bag in which police believe contained personal belongings, and each day he would return with the bag empty. It appears as if he was disposing of all belongings and traces of his identity and carefully avoided CCTV around the city whilst doing so. On June 13th, he purchased a handful of stamps and airmail stickers, but no one has been able to trace where he might have sent packages. 
On the day before his death, he asked a local taxi driver to take him to the quietest beach in Silgo for a swim. Once there, he scouted the area for a short time before returning to the taxi, seemingly content with what he had found. On the day of his death, he left the hotel carrying two bags and his purple plastic bag. He was missing one of the pieces of luggage he had originally had when he checked into the hotel, and it was never found. He walked to the Quayside Shopping Center, waited there for a bit, then stopped for a sandwich at a corner shop. Seen looking at a piece of paper over and over again, he finally tore it up and left to catch a bus for Ross's point. Witnesses on the beach described him behaving in a strange and erratic manner, walking parallel to the water and also parallel to a beam of sunlight on the beach. His naked corpse was later found washed up on the shore, with his clothes and belongings scattered along the sand, including a black leather jacket, jumper, pants, shoes, socks, a wristwatch, and some cash but the story gets even stranger. Despite the fact that his body appeared to wash up on shore, the autopsy revealed he didn't drown. There were no signs of foul play. The man's autopsy also showed he had advanced prostate cancer, bone tumors, and had previously suffered from heart attacks. What's more interesting is that the toxicology report showed there weren't any painkillers in his system which is rare for someone who is suffering from such ill health. Upon further inspections of his belongings, authorities realized that all the tags in his clothes were also cut out. The search for any information about the mysterious Peter Bergman went on for months and stretched across Europe, but no one has ever identified the man. 10. The Carey Babies On 14 April 1984, the body of a newborn baby was found on a beach in Caharserine, County Kerry, Ireland. He had been stabbed to death. When the child could not be identified, he was named Baby John. The investigating Garda asked the locals about a pregnant woman and heard about a 25-year-old named Joanne Hayes, who lived 75 kilometers away in Abbey Dorney, She had been pregnant as the result of an affair with a colleague, a married man, Jeremiah Locke, who was also the father of her older child. Under police questioning, Joanne said she had in fact given birth on the night of April 12th in a field on the family farm. She had panicked, thinking the baby was dead, and left him there. In the morning, she had found the child dead and buried him on the farm. In other words, according to her, baby John wasn't hers. The Garda didn't believe her. She offered to take them to the body of her child. They refused. After a lot of questioning, Joanne Hayes confessed that baby John was hers and that she had killed him, and her family confessed to having dumped the body. Their confessions contained accurate details about the crime, They would later say that they were assaulted, intimidated, and coerced into these confessions. Garda deny it. Joanne was charged with murder. The next day, a family member finally convinced a Garda to come to Abidorney, where they found the body of Joanne's baby. The state pathologist couldn't determine the cause or manner of death. No one knows whether the child was stillborn, died naturally, died of exposure, or was murdered. Blood tests confirm that the child had type O blood, matching both Hayes and Locke. On the other hand, baby John had type A blood, which seemed to rule out the possibility of Hayes as the mother. However, investigators later claimed that Hayes had somehow become pregnant by two different men and had given birth to twins through super fundication. The authorities believed that both deceased babies were hers. Hayes was charged with baby John's murder, but the case garnered so much controversy that all the charges against Hayes and her family were thrown out. 
Hayes was never charged in connection with the death of her own child. The identity of baby John's biological parents and the circumstances of his murder are still unknown. <laughs>